Hello, the Internet. Let's fix a revolver and talk about use of weapons by Ian M. Banks. I'm going to leave out the spoilers, and FYI, the Wikipedia article has some big spoilers. Use of Weapons is the third published culture novel, but you can read them in any order. They're independent. Now, a revolver is a variant on an old-fashioned. The old-fashioned is whiskey, simple syrup, and bitters. We're going to replace the simple syrup with Kahlua, sweet coffee liqueur. If you use less sweet coffee liqueur, you may need to add additional sugar syrup. Heck, if you want it sweet, you can add simple syrup to your revolver. It's your drink. I like a dash Angostura bitters, stir and strain over an ice ball, garnish with lemon zest if you like, orange peel is classic, quick and easy, very accessible, spirit forward, but balanced. The revolver reflects the theme of the book, the use of weapons. Liquor could be a weapon. Everything is a weapon if you're smart and have a certain moral flexibility. The theme is summed up in chapter Roman numeral 8. The self-seeking need to survive was a thing with two shadows. It was two things. It was the need, and it was the method. The need was obvious to defeat what opposed life. The method was that taking and bending of materials and people to one purpose. The outlook that everything could be used in the fight. Nothing could be excluded. Everything was a weapon. That the ability to handle those weapons, to find them, choose which one to aim and fire, that talent, that ability, that use of weapons. The culture novels are set in a universe where the galaxy is populated by many different civilizations, many of which have technology so advanced it is indistinguishable from magic. One such civilization calls itself the culture. Culture is a post-scarcity utopia run by benevolent minds, super-intelligent machines evolved from AI. These beings run the massive spacefaring vehicles and truly vast orbital habitats that house, feed, and entertain culture citizens, human, sentient alien, and machine. Wait a minute. So, are you telling me the mines are ships? Yes, so the mines are the ships. Oh. I just pictured them as brains and somewhere in space in big glass jars. At one point in Consider Phlebas, a mind gets isolated from its ship. Mm. And, yeah, and it, it just looks like a very large, very dense egg shape, kind of. Yeah. To human uh, perception, it's a big solid object without any clarity or internal features. Oh. To more advanced senses, it's more dense than uranium and is, if you had an electron microscope, you'd see that every square nanometer was crowded with stuff uh, that we just, as humans, can't see. They're well, right. extremely... Like, even nanotechnology doesn't get it how advanced they are. Much of what they are extends into dimensions that we can't perceive or interact with directly. Huh. Technology so advanced it's indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. At one point, Ian and Banks compared them to uh, rather light gods, but on the far side. Hmm. On the far side? So, like, on a continuum from humans... To gods, they are like gods on the far side. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Now, generally, the books focus on places and times where the culture interacts with other societies. Those interactions are handled by the appropriate named division of the culture called Contact. Contact's mission is to interact with and intervene in the business of other civilizations. There's no Star Trek Starfleet Prime Directive for the culture. They are actively interventionist and encourage the development of many societies. Their actions aim to reduce suffering and improve happiness as they see it. When things get out of hand and there's no statistical playbook to follow, there's a smaller group within contact called Special Circumstances. Use of Weapons follows a man named Sheredanin Zakalwe, originally from outside the culture but engaged by Special Circumstances because of his military abilities. His special talent is the use of weapons. Being hedonistic and indulgent, very little of the culture organizes itself to make warriors. As one sentient spider named Chori puts it in chapter Roman numeral 4, the culture is a tiny core of special circumstances, a shell of contact, and a vast, chaotic ecosphere of everything else, and the ecosphere is more disparate and less distinct than the wrapping of atmosphere around a globe. Is a callway at that time, was considering whether to join the culture in special circumstances. The spider confides, but in the end, 
you will never know the rest of the culture because you will be like me in special circumstances and only ever know them as the great irresistible force behind you. People like you and I are at the edge. You will in time come to feel like the tooth on the biggest saw in the galaxy. Then the spider and Zakawe have a drinking contest and both end up passed out in a public fountain. Chori is suspended by all eight leg hooks from a nearby railing, snoring with a sporadic clattering noise. The book is highly non-linear, with chapters appearing in a strange alternating order. The main plot is in Arabic numbered chapters from 1 to 14. Alternating between those are Roman numeral chapters that count down from no Roman numeral 13 to Roman numeral 1. Miscellaneous other flashbacks are mixed into this heady brew. You want to pause to talk about the weird order? Yes, because I still didn't get it, no matter how... Man, we, we we tried to get through that book. Like, I loved that book. How long did it take us to actually get through it? Six months. Holy fuck. Okay, okay, okay that's my doing. That's my bad. I, I, I own that. <laughs> we know. The part of it is the chapter shit, okay? It, it is that's legitimately it. confusing. And so I tried to kind of lay that out for somebody coming to the book for the first time. The way it works is... It goes 1, Roman numeral 13, 2, Roman numeral 12, 3, Roman numeral 11, and so on. So the Roman numerals are counting down, and the Arabic numerals are counting up. And what's weird, though, is that the Roman numerals are in reverse chronological order. So because they're counting down, that means they're moving forward in time. Right, so if you look at the timeline, it goes Roman numeral 13 all the way down to 1, and then chapter 1 up to 14. But we're jumping between 1, 13, 2, 12, 3, 11, and so on, always moving forward through time, but counting up for the main plot arc and down for the flashbacks. Oh, but they're so they're interspersed. They are interspersed, and there are flashbacks within the flashbacks. So, like in chapter two, there will be just a flashback to twenty years ago before Dizyet meets uh, Shradnin. Right. And that's not a chapter thing. That's just a flashback that's thrown in. Right. So yeah, it it is legitimately a very confusing plot line. Yeah, I wish he hadn't done it that way. But I, you can't get the climax without that, because that's true. The, the that's true. I the, will give him that. The big, kind of uh, sixth sense, um, M Night Shyamalan reveal at the end, only works thanks to this construction. Screwed up, con yeah. It also means it would be basically impossible to make a movie out of this. Despite so many wonderfully filmable things in it. I don't know. That True Life movie worked. <laughs> God, I'll never... I'll, that Did movie it? Was, no. Did it work? I wanted to claw my eyes out. I don't think we finished it. <laughs> we didn't finish that movie. That was so bad. <laughs> I, I, would, I would argue that that didn't work, actually. You're and right. it is an example right. of why, why this, this wouldn't, wouldn't work. work. Okay, scratch that. <laughs> Wrong. This main story arc is the story of how Zakawe gets picked up by the culture operative Dizyat Sma and her briefcase-shaped psychopath drone companion Skafin Umtiska. They take Zakawe to a planet where he is supposed to meet and make contact with an old war buddy named Beishai. Now retired Beishai was a war hero. The culture thinks he might have enough political and popular influence to prevent an all-out civil war in his home planet. The culture has deemed this outcome desirable. The plan goes sideways, of course, with Sakalwe ending up leading a clan of gay warrior monks in a proxy war on another planet entirely. The fact that the warrior monks are gay is incidental to the plot, but may tie in with the culture's reputation as fully automated luxury gay space communism. Zakalwe's payment for soldiering is rejuvenation, which is easy for the culture, some foreign currency, the culture doesn't have money, and the culture's help locating a woman named Livueta. I'm not going to spoil it, but the reason he's looking for her will shock you. That's how you do it, right? Clickbait for books? Bookbait? Litbait? I should copyright litbait. Litbait? The culture tapped as a colleague both. Litbait. Oh. Literature bait. 
I got it. Lick bait. That's mine now. I own that. Sounds like lick bait. But, <sighs> but you're right. Lit bait. Like literature bait. Right. Okay. I yeah, like lick bait would be something else entirely. I don't like it. That's too good. The culture tap Zakalwe both because he knows Beishai personally and because Zakalwe is a military genius. He seems nearly invincible, though it just seems that way. He understands better than most that military victory is as much down to luck as anything else. He also has obvious and debilitating PTSD having to do with a chair. For much of the book, he cannot sleep anywhere. A chair is present. Two vignettes stand out in my mind. Neither are part of the main plot and won't spoil anything. The first that stands out is in chapter Roman numeral 4, where Zakawe first experiences life on board a culture vessel, a general systems vehicle. The GSV is 80 kilometers long for some sci-fi reference. That's more than four times as long as the Super Star Destroyer from Empire Strikes Back. Slightly less nerdy, it's about four times as long as the Isle of Manhattan. But unlike Manhattan, it's populated not just on the surface, but through the whole volume, putting its population at something on the order of 100 million people. The name of this vehicle? The size isn't everything. Zakalwe didn't grow up in the culture, and he gawks at the enormity of the GSV. He asks, how can it hold together? And I can't help but think he means that in two senses. He means, how can an object 80 kilometers long not break under the strain of acceleration? Think force fields, Diziot tells him. It's all done with force fields. But I think he also means, how can all these people hold together and not kill one another? The huge ship was an enchanted ocean in which you could never drown, and he threw himself into it to try to understand, if not it, then the people who had built it. He walked for days, stopping at bars and restaurants whenever he felt thirsty, hungry, or tired. Mostly they were automatic, and he was served by little floating trays. Though a few were staffed by real people, they seemed less like servants, and more like customers who'd taken a notion to help out for a while. He talked to people all the time, in bars and cafes mostly. The GSV's accommodation seemed to be divided into various different types of layout. Valleys, or ziggurats if you wanted to look at them like that, seemed to be the most common, though there were different configurations. He ate when he was hungry and drank when he was thirsty, every time trying a different dish or drink from the stunningly complicated menus. And when he had wanted to sleep, he just asked a drone, and was directed to the nearest unoccupied room. The rooms were all roughly the same size, and yet all slightly different. Some were very plain. Some were highly decorated. The basics were always there. Bed, sometimes a real physical bed, sometimes one of their weird field beds. Somewhere to wash and defecate. Cupboards, places for personal effects. A fake window, a hollow screen of some sort, and a link-up to the rest of the communications net both aboard and off-ship. The first night away he linked into one of their direct-link sensory entertainments, lying on the bed with some sort of device activated under the pillow. He did not actually dream that night. Instead, he was a bold pirate prince who'd renounced his nobility to lead a brave crew against the slaver ships of a terrible empire amidst the spice and treasure isles. Their quick little ships darted amongst the lumbering galleons, picking away the rigging with chain shot. They came ashore on moonless nights, attacking the great prison castles releasing joyous captives, he personally fought the wicked governor's cheap torturer. Sword against sword, the man finally fell from a high tower. An alliance with a beautiful lady pirate begot a more personal relaison, and a daring rescue from a mountain monastery when she was captured. Is he at sea? So, Zakalwe, it's basically dream virtual reality. It's a shared dream slash game that people in the culture like to play. Oh. So, is he dreaming? Not exactly, but because he remembers all of it, and it was vivid, and as if he lived it. Well, where is it taking place? Where is his body? His body is still in bed, and it's all in, taking place inside the simulation that the mind is running. Oh. He pulled away from it. After what had been weeks of compressed time, he knew somewhere in the back of his mind even as it happened, that none of it was real. But that seemed like the least important property of the adventure. When he came out of it, surprised to discover he had not actually ejaculated during some of the more profoundly convincing erotic episodes, he discovered that only a night had passed, and it was morning, and he had somehow shared the strange story with others. It had been a match, apparently. 
People had left messages for him to get in touch. They had enjoyed playing the match with him so much. He felt oddly ashamed and did not reply. Why was he ashamed? Yeah. I think that is a really, really interesting and deep question. At one was point... Was it the not ejaculating part? I think we're allowed to take it that way. I think that Ian M. Banks threw that in as a sort of... If you want to think he's ashamed because he had what felt like a nocturnal emission but wasn't, you can think that. But I don't think that's it. Me either. I think that... It just seems too easy. It, it reveals something about him. And on one hand, when he when Dizziet asks if he'd just like to... Dizziet Small, I should say. Asks if he would just like to stay and live among the culture and not join special circumstances. He says, no, I'd be bored to tears and I'd probably just end up spending my whole life in one of those simulation things. Um, so he... He finds those simulations more interesting than reality, but yet feels ashamed of that fact. And I think it's because he is guilty. Mm. He feels a lot of survivor's guilt. Oh. And, and playing these games where he pretends to be risking things and pretends to be a warrior when he is in fact a warrior with his life on the line regularly feels like, feels, yeah, a shameful, shameful thing to do. Shameful thing to do because he's not being a warrior? Yeah, because he's copping out and doing a risk-free oh. version of the thing he's good at. Oh, and I see. And given his history, that's... I think I think anyone who's lived a high stakes life might feel some of that. I think if you or I got adopted by the culture, there would be a certain amount of how how can I live with myself being so lucky to be so protected and entertained and pretending to do these things when I know that there are real people really doing them, really living them right now. It's kind of like how we view wasting food. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like there are people in this world who are hungry. How dare you waste food? Yeah. There, there are people in the universe who are suffering. How dare I it's pretend to suffer? It's taking things for granted. Yeah. I think I that's like right. That. The other vignette occurs early in the novel. Given the culture's decadence, it would be easy to think of them as weak. And this would be a mistake. The contrast between their outward gentle nature and their capabilities for violence are illustrated in the second little vignette that I love. Dizziet, culture agent, watches her colleague slash drone Scaphanumptiska make a crown of daisies. The moment seems peaceful and bucolic. Then we flash back to another mission on a low-tech planet. Slavers showed up to kidnap Dizziet as she was pretty and foreign and they assumed easy prey. Scaphan defended her from the brigands. And I'll read that passage. Once, maybe twenty years ago, far away on another planet in another part of the galaxy altogether, on the floor of a dry sea forever scoured by howling winds, beneath the mesa that had been islands on dust that had been silt, she had lodged in a small frontier town at the limit of the railway's reach, preparatory to hiring mounts to venture into the deep desert and search out a new child messiah. At dusk the riders came into the square to take her from the inn. They had heard her strangely colored skin alone would fetch a handsome price. The innkeeper made the mistake of trying to reason with the men and was pinned to his own door with a sword. His daughters wept over him before they were dragged away. Sma turned, sickened, from the window, heard boots thunder on the rickety stairs. Scaphanumptiska was near the door. It looked unhurried at her. Screams came from the square outside and from elsewhere inside the inn. Somebody battered at the door of her room, loosing dust and shaking the floor. Sma was wide-eyed, bereft of stratagems. She stared at the drone. Do something, she gulped. My pleasure, murmured Scaphanumptiska. The door burst open, slamming against the mud wall. Sma flinched. 
The two black-cloaked men filled the doorway. She could smell them. One strode in toward her, sword out, rope in the other hand, not noticing the drone at one side. Excuse me, said Scaphanumthuska. The men glanced at the machine without breaking stride. Then he wasn't there any more. And dust filled the room, and Sma's ears were ringing, and pieces of mud and paper were falling from the ceiling and flooding through the air, and there was a large hole straight across the wall, across the room, across from Sir Scamphanumtuska, seemingly defying the law concerning action-reaction, hovered in exactly the same place as before. A woman screeched hysterically in the room through the hole where the left of the man was embedded in the wall above her bed. His blood spattered copiously over the ceiling, floor, walls, bed, and her. The second man whirled into the room, discharging a long gun point-blank at the drone. The bullet became a flat coin of metal in a centimeter in front of the machine's snout and clunked to the floor. The man unsheathed his sword, and in one flashing movement, scything at the drone through the smoke and dust, the blade broke cleanly on a bump of red-colored field just above the machine's casing. Then the man was lifted off his feet. Small was crouched down in the corner, dust in her mouth, hands at her ears, listening to herself scream. The man thrashed wildly in the center of the room for a second, and then he was a blur through the air above her. There was another colossal pulse of sound, and a ragged aperture appealed in the wall over her head beside the window looking out to the square. The floorboards jumped and dust choked her. Stop! she screamed. The wall above the hole cracked and the ceiling creaked and bowed down, releasing lumps of mud and straw and dust clogged her mouth and nose, and she struggled to her feet, almost throwing herself out the window in a desperate attempt to find air. Stop! she croaked coughing dust. The drones floated smoothly to her side, wafting the dust away from Small's face with a field plane and supporting the sagging ceiling with a slender column. Both field components were shaded deep red, the color of drone pleasure. There, there, Scaffinum Discuss said to her, patting her back. Small choked and spluttered from the window and stared horrified at the square below. The body of the second man lay like a sodden red sack under the cloud of dust in the midst of the riders when they were still staring, before most of the raiders could raise their swords and before the innkeeper's daughters being lashed to two of the mounts by their captors realized what was almost unrecognizable lump on the ground in front of them was and started screaming again. Something thrummed past Small's shoulder and darted down toward the men. One of the warriors roared, brandishing his sword and lunging toward the door to the inn. He managed two steps. He was still roaring when the knife missile flicked past him, field outstretched. It separated his neck from his shoulders. The roar turned into a sound like the wind bubbling thickly through the exposed windpipe as his body crashed to the dust. Faster and turning more tightly than any bird or insect, the knife missile made an almost invisibly quick circle around the riders, producing an odd, stuttering noise. Seven of the riders, five standings, two still mounted, collapsed into the dust in fourteen separate pieces. Sma tried to scream at the drone to make the missile stop, but she was still choking and now starting to retch. The drone patted her back. There, there, it said concernedly. In the square, both of the innkeeper's daughters slipped to the ground from the mounts they had been tied to, their bonds slashed in the same cut that had killed all seven men. The drone gave a little shudder of satisfaction. Oh, you should have read Dizzy's response. Oh, I, yeah. That her, would have been great. Her response is epic. Oh. She calls him a meat f***er, though. I wasn't sure I should say that on the video. Now I feel self-conscious. <laughs> How many swear words have I used just now? I oh, don't no, even know. It's fine. At least three. I, I think it was just shit. It's fine. Oh, no, I've used my... Now, how does he pat her back? What the heck? He doesn't have hands. <laughs> he has it's a briefcase. He has field planes. He extends a field. There, there. <laughs> there, there. Cute. <laughs> now, Use of Weapons is a space opera, and if you like that kind of thing, you might like it. It has a depth to it, too, which I think is rare among space opera books. Even very good and influential books in the genre like Ringworld often focus more on the big ideas rather than the human themes. Yusu Weapon does both, but it's not an easy book. It can be hard to follow at times. There are no big climactic resolutions either. It sets them up like a normal space opera, but then subverts them in the most unexpected ways. If there were a Death Star with a vulnerable thermal exhaust port, you can be guaranteed that let's blow this thing and go home will not pan out in use of weapons. It has some very dark humor as well. I hope you read it. It's really good. It's one of my favorites. 
okay, look, the others are gone now. Nobody else watched this. We got all the way to the end. It's just us here. The special circumstances core of my viewership. Now, maybe this is just the revolver talking, but I think we might actually be in one of these simulations. We might just be waiting to wake up back in the culture, having had a grand adventure on this primitive planet where pain and injustice are the downsides to the rules that make the game interesting. We may be living in a Roy scenario. Shit! Shit! Oh! Oh, what the hell? Whoa, whoa, where am That isn't what makes me crazy, though. What makes me crazy is that I don't think that makes much difference to anything. I just kind of hope it's true. See you, Space Cowboy.